Did you know that for a long time in the Anglican Church in England, part of the ecclesiastical garb for bishops was wearing gaiters, those things on your leg that protect your legs from rain and cold and wet and briars and things like that. And then, uh, and the reason this started was because bishops would go from church to church to church, and they would be riding their horse doing it, and they would be wearing their gaiters when they did it. And so even after cars came into being and bishops were no longer riding horses anywhere, it was until the mid-20th century that they actually stopped wearing gaiters as part of their Episcopal uniform, as part of the uniform of being a priest. I'm Murray Richmond, and today we're going to be talking about traditions. I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in Medford, and we're doing a three-part series now looking at Fiddler on the Roof. Last week, we looked at the importance of tradition. This week, we're going to be looking at how traditions need to change. And next week, we're looking at things that should never change. I hope that this service is a blessing to you and that you are somehow drawn closer to God by participating with us in this worship. Amen. join our hearts in the call to worship. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord.
gospel lesson comes to us today from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 2. And this is a whole section where Jesus is um, foregoing the traditions that would have him do certain things and doing loving things instead. Hear the word of the Lord. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Likewise, the patch pulls away from it the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God, where Abiathar was high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In my second church in North Carolina, Trinity Avenue Presbyterian, uh, I was an associate pastor. And the first Sunday that I did communion there, I noticed something kind of different. Now, in the Presbyterian tradition, well, the way it's normally done is that the minister does the words of institution at the table. The elders come up. He gives them first trays of bread. And the elders pass out the trays of bread to the congregation. And then they come back and they sit down. And the pastor takes the tray and feeds each of the elder while doing, saying to them, this is the body of Christ given for you. And then the same thing happens with grape juice. They come up, get trays of little glasses of juice, pass them out. And then the pastor serves them as they're seated. Well, in this church, everything was going fine. And when, I, when I got back, um, I got the trays. And then a, a, an acolyte who'd been standing beside the communion table, and I wasn't sure why, took the tray from my hand. And he carried it to each elder, and I walked along behind him and said, the body of Christ given for you or the blood of Christ shed for you. And I asked people, you know, why does the acolyte carry the tray? And they said, oh, we've always done it that way. It's just one of our traditions here. And I'm like, okay. And nobody could seem to give me any answer other than that. And then uh, a couple of years later, I was having lunch with the retired senior pastor. And I said, you know, there's this tradition about the acolyte carrying the communion trays to serve the elders. And he just laughed and he said, oh, I started that. The trays got too heavy for me to carry. And that's how tradition starts. Now, if I had gone to that church and saw the acolyte doing it and then said, I don't think we ought to do this anymore and tried to change their tradition, oh, there would have been holy hell to pay. Uh, people would have been all over me because I'm changing their beloved tradition. You know, when we worship here, we do communion very differently now than we did when I first got here. When I first got here, we did exactly what I described as what happened at Trinity Avenue, except without the acolyte carrying the trays. And now we do it by what's called intinction, which means dipping. And people come forward and they either get the little plastic packet or they can tear off bread and dip it into the juice. Um, we started that because of COVID. We, we didn't feel like passing a tray of bread around for everybody to put their hands on we didn't feel like that was a good idea. So that's how the tradition of how we do communion now got changed. Traditions change over time. Sometimes traditions get started for reasons that no one understands now, like that old senior pastor not being able to carry the trays. Sometimes they get changed because of circumstances around us. COVID changed basically everything about what we do. Traditions have been changing in the church for thousands of years. You might say it's a tradition 
to change our traditions. You know, one of the things that's changed, and I'm sure some of you will appreciate this, it used to be when you baptized people and you only baptized adults, they were baptized naked. They would be in the back behind what would, where our organ pipes would be back here, and there would be a door here, and while they were behind the, the open area in front, they would take all their clothes off, symbolizing getting rid of their old life, and they would walk out, start naked in front of God and everybody. They would be baptized, and then people would put a new fresh white robe on them, signifying that this was their new life in Christ. Well, we don't do that anymore. We don't even baptize naked babies anymore. That tradition was changed a long, long time ago. Lots and lots of traditions have been changed over the years. As I said last week, the movie Fiddler on the Roof is really about tradition, how tradition shapes and forms us, and what happens when traditions don't work anymore. What happens when traditions change? And how do they change? How do we handle the changes? In the movie, Tevia the Milkman, who's the main figure in the movie, has five daughters. Five daughters. The oldest daughter, Tzidel, is of marrying age, and traditionally marriages were made by Yenta, the village matchmaker. And indeed, Yenta comes to the house of Tevia and his wife, Golda, at one point, and the girls don't know what she's talking about, but they know that the matchmaker has come to the house so there is likely to be a match. And they go out and sing this wonderful song, Matchmaker, Matchmaker. And during the song, they realize that, you know, they start off by, you know, imagining that the matchmaker is going to bring them the most wonderful man in the world and they're going to be, live happily in love forever after. But as they get into the song, they begin to realize that it may not work out that way. Some of the lyrics are, Hava, I found him. Won't you be a lucky bride? He's handsome. He's tall at least from side to side, but he's a nice man, a good catch, right? Right. I heard he has a temper. He'll beat you every night, but only when he's sober, so you're all right. Seidel does not want to get involved in a match like that. And in fact, Yenta, the matchmaker, is there to make a match. She wants to match Seidel with Leza Wolf, the butcher, who is much older than Seidel. Now, there are some problems with that match. It's the age, but the bigger issue is that Seidel and a tailor named Model have pledged themselves to marriage without the matchmaker. They have given each other a pledge. Unheard. Unthinkable. They gave each other a pledge? People don't do that. Matches are made by the matchmaker. Young people do not choose their mates. Their mates are chosen for them. It's, it's tradition. But Tevia can see that Seidel and Model are in love. And he says, he's asked, you know, he's looking at God and he says, so who is the matchmaker for Adam and Eve? And then he looks at Seidel and Model and says, perhaps they have the same matchmaker. And Papa decides that he is not going to force Seidel to marry Laser Wolf, even though he and Laser Wolf shook hands on it. Tevia starts to see that if he forces his daughter to marry this man, she is going to be miserable. So she allows her to marry for love. A tradition changes. Jesus broke a lot of traditions in his day. For instance, in today's lesson, where he's picking grain, doing agriculture on the Sabbath, which according to the traditions passed down from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi, that's the wrong way to act on the Sabbath. And yet Jesus lets his disciples do it. He doesn't stop them. And you know when they, they confront him on that, he says the Sabbath was made for people not people for the Sabbath. And that gives us a clue as to what's important to Jesus and what isn't. As we've read before, he does not do the ritual washing of hands before eating. He heals people on the Sabbath. He denounces the authorities. Now, in, in that tradition, the authorities were to be respected. 
You don't yell at the religious leaders, but Jesus was often not very kind to the scribes and the Pharisees and said some pretty, pretty uh, uh, damaging things to them. Jesus eats with sinners, people of dubious reputation. And the tr tradition, which you find a lot in the book of Psalms, is that you stay as far away as you can from unrighteous people. You don't want their, their sins to stain you in some way. And yet, Jesus goes to a lot of dinner parties, and a lot of these are with sinners. He touches lepers, and that would make him incredibly unclean. Matter of fact, unable to become clean again. No amount of mikvah bass will help him if he touches a leper, and yet he does it. Jesus forgives people's sins and says they don't have to go to the temple and make a sacrifice or wait for Yom Kippur, the high holy day. Jesus can forgive their sins. And then one of the ultimate scandals, when he said, this is my blood, the Old Testament is very, very strict about drinking blood. You're not supposed to do it. And yet, that is the metaphor that Jesus uses for one of our most sacred sacraments, communion. What we see is a principle that Jesus uses over and over again. People first. There may be a tradition, but if your tr tradition gets... <coughs> Excuse me. If your tradition gets in the way of serving people, uh, of loving people, you need to rethink the tradition. Someone needs healing, but it's the Sabbath. Now, forget the Sabbath. Heal them. He denounced religious authorities because they were making it harder and harder for ordinary people to enjoy a relationship with God. He treated women as equals and did not treat them as if their gender disqualified them from having a relationship with God. You know, in that day and, and still today in some places, Orthodox Jews wake up in the morning and one of the first prayers a male says is, I thank you, Lord, for not making me a woman. I don't think Jesus prayed that prayer. I think, unlike the tradition of the day, he fully accepted women into his circle. Of course, the biggest break with tradition in the Christian church has to do with you and me that we can be a part of this movement of Jesus' followers. It goes, I mean, the early Christians were all Jews, and, and Jesus came to the Jews. He preached to the Jews, and when he died and then was resurrected and ascended into heaven, he left the church to all Jewish people. And as the book of Acts tells us, Peter has this vision where a blanket full of unclean foods come down and the Lord tells him to take and eat. And Peter says, I would never eat that. It's unclean. And then he has the vision again. And the Lord and Peter says, I would never eat it. It's unclean. And finally God says to him, what I say is clean is clean. Forget the tradition. If I tell you to eat it, eat it. And then God sends Peter to the house of a Gentile, a man named Cornelius, Jesus preaches the story of Jesus. Peter preaches the story of Jesus to him. And Cornelius is touched and wants to become a follower of Jesus. So Peter has him baptized. Unheard of. Unthinkable. But thank goodness, thank God, that tradition changed. And we can be a part of this. Things were changing in Israel in the first century and the followers of Jesus were on top of those changes. And they knew that they were going to have to change if they were going to be faithful to the mission that God had given them to spread the word of God's love to all people. Now, I can imagine some of those early Jewish followers of Jesus saying, you know, this used to be a really nice religion until we started let them Gentiles join. But new wine calls for new wineskins, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was certainly new wine. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But you put new wine into fresh wineskins. 
Think about the wineskins as the tradition of our faith. Over time, they get old. They start to crack. They don't work as well as they used to. And if you put new wine in them, they will break. And you lose all the wine. And your wineskin. Not a good thing. Times change. Our traditions are the wineskins that surround us. And they get old over time. They don't work. Or they get stayed. They're boring. People don't need those traditions anymore. Things change. And so the question that we have, are we going to be continually getting new wineskins so that we can continually be receiving the new wine of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, things have changed. With the pro proliferation, for instance, of PowerPoints and TV and kids learning through video and things like that, the idea of someone sitting to listen to even a 20-minute talk is pretty much unheard of. I mean, the fact is, we pastors are about the only people that do that now. Every college professor worth their salt now uses PowerPoints and all sorts of other things. You know, I think back to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, each one of them was three hours long. I don't think, I think if you had a debate and said these two people are going to talk for three hours about politics, I don't think it'd draw many people these days because we're just not used to hearing that much talking. We do not have to keep doing things just because they are a tradition. Some traditions are outdated and look foolish in our modern world. Other traditions are actually harmful for some people. The Presbyterian Church was split geographically um, until 1983. You had the Southern Presbyterian Church, and then what Southerners, were, which is where I came from, uh, called the Northern Presbyterian Church, which was actually the Presbyterian Church in the rest of the country. Um, the first woman ordained in the Northern Church, or the church in the rest of the country, uh, was ordained in, in 1956. It was almost in my lifetime before we had women in ministry. And in the Southern Church, the first woman was ordained in 1965. We excluded half of the human race from ordained ministry, from being an elder, a deacon, or a pastor. That was harmful. Imagine how many fine people we could have had during that time. But because the tradition was men only, we didn't. Now it's almost mandatory in the Presbyterian Church. When I started ministry, I had an annual tradition, which I no longer do. I would uh, oversee the ad that went into the yellow pages every year, and I would oversee the ad that went on the maps, paper maps, that the tourist bureau used to hand out. The reason I stopped doing it is because, well, when's the last time you used paper yellow pages or a paper map? We just don't do that anymore. We need new wineskins for new wine. You know, the Apostle Paul warned us about being held captive by human traditions, traditions that for some reason got into place like the acolyte carrying the trays or, or other things and they become the be all and end all of everything and they're human traditions. They're not things that are given to us from God and Paul warns us about being held captive by those things. And there are times when we have to change our traditions. How do we know that? It's not always easy. And, you know, at the beginning of the process, we should ask ourselves, am I wanting this tradition to change just because I think it will help other people, or is it because I just don't like this particular tradition? We do not have to keep doing things just because they are a tradition. Some traditions are outdated and look foolish to the modern world. Um, some traditions have changed so much. The world has changed so much that the traditions make no sense at all. And sometimes we're so bound in our own traditions 
that we have a hard time seeing that they could be changed. I thought of a few here. Sunday morning worship. Most people are taking Sunday mornings off now. And in fact, more and more groups are scheduling recreational activities for Sunday morning. When I lived in Alaska, the student council of the North Pole High School met on Sunday mornings, as did soccer teams and, and all sorts of other activities were going on. You know, I've seen churches have great success with Friday or Saturday night services because people can go to church then and then they can have their Sunday mornings to themselves. Me, I'd love to sit and listen to NPR all Sunday morning, but I'm here with you fine folks. You know, you out there in the online world, I bet you're watching this on Sunday because you're used to, but the fact is you could watch it any time during the week that you want. Um, our music. You know, when we started Jazz Vespers here, the question I got asked the most, and I got asked it a lot, was, is it okay to have jazz in church? And, and my answer was, it's okay to have classical music. You know, it doesn't have words, and it's not doing anything offensive. If it's okay to have classical music that may or not be explicitly Christian, why isn't it okay to have jazz as well? Of course it is, if that's something that moves and moves people and brings them closer to God. Another tradition we have is that we're building-centric. It's only church if it happens in the church building. Now, during the time of COVID, when we weren't able to gather together, we learned how to find ways around that. And maybe we need to go back and revisit some of those. Maybe we can do church and not be in this building all the time. Again, you in the online audience, you know that. You're sitting at home watching this. And yet, I would say for you, this is church. This is church. Can you think of any other things that we do that we just assume has to be done, but in fact doesn't? I hear tell that when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, nobody's put out a bulletin for it. He just got up and spoke. How can you have a church service without a bulletin? But Jesus did. Some traditions are actually harmful for some groups. I mentioned the ordination of women and how we had shut them out of ministry for so many years. The Church of Jesus Christ has excluded gays and lesbians since, well, since there was a church. I've come to know many gay men and lesbians these past 15 years, and I noticed a strong trend. Most of them have been deeply hurt by a church. And I'm glad that that's starting to turn around. Now, I think we've done a good job of making our church a place where our traditions don't hurt people. Instead, we really focus on helping people. We have the tradition of bag lunches. We have the tradition of our food bank. We have the tradition here of when people walk in off the street and need something, if we can do something for them, we do it. I think that's a great tradition. Sometimes... We need to change our traditions because they really keep us from having a more intimate relationship with God. We're focusing more on the tradition than we're focusing on God. In the Old Testament, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, God said he wasn't real crazy about the people's fasting and their sacrifices. Matter of fact, he hated them. Because their hearts were far from God. They were thinking, if I sacrifice this, if I do this, then that will bring me closer to God and I don't have to do anything myself except pay for the sacrifice. And it doesn't work that way. In a relationship with God, you kind of have to be all in on everything. And sometimes our traditions make us think that we are closer to God than we really are. Some religious practices can fool us into believing we are relating to God when in fact we're just relating to the practice more than we're relating to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need new wineskins for new wine. Tevye realizes that if he makes his daughter marry Laza Wolf the butcher, he will condemn her to a life of ministry. So he lets the tradition change. And Model can ask Seidel to marry him, and she can say yes, and there will be a wedding. That was radical in the day. Very radical. During the offertory, Alyssa and Chris will be singing a song that pertains to Tevya and his wife. 
Theirs was an arranged marriage and love was not a factor. And now they're asking about love in their life because even though the tradition excluded love from the role of marriage, two people who are living together often find they fall in love. And even though that's not the basis for marriage back then, it kind of was deep down inside. When you married people, you hoped that they would learn to love one another. We can't get rid of the tradition of love in marriage. That would be awful. What other traditions must we hold on to? Must we cling to because they are so important to our faith? Well, that is what we're going to look at next week. So, embrace the traditions that are helpful, that draw you closer to God, that make it easier for you to help other people. And if you run into those that aren't, maybe time to get rid of them. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, it can be a tricky thing trying to have a relationship with you. And, you know, because you're not visible and tangible and we can audibly hear you and things like that, it, we have to depend on other ways of getting in touch with you. And some of those are our traditions. And help us to cling tightly to those traditions that bring us closer to you. But sometimes our traditions make us just think we're closer to you and sometimes they actually keep us from you, from doing the things that you might call us to do. And so, Lord, help us to be objective as we look at how we forge a relationship with you and what traditions are helpful, how we worship on Sundays and what traditions are helpful there, how we as a church reach out to other people to give them the great news of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And when we have traditions that get in the way of our mission, or that get in the way of our own relationship with God, or that drag other people away from God, help us to be quick to jettison those, but to cling to those that do bring us closer to you. Oh Lord, help us to not throw everything away willy-nilly, because there are many traditions we have that uphold us. And they tell us who we are and what you expect of us. But there are many traditions that are just add-ons, just gilded lilies that don't really do much for us and keep us from the real joy of a fresh lily. Help us, help us to wrestle with the traditions we have and help us to remember that in the end, it comes down to how we love you and how we love others. And one of the ways we love others is to pray for them, Lord, and we ask that you hear the prayers of our hearts at this time. Lord, we ask that you would protect Brendan, Mike, and Elizabeth's son, who's working as a firefighter up on the lookout fire, and also for their little grandson, Cade, for healing for his health issues and a good report for his upcoming specialist appointments. We continue to pray for Lonnie Hagler's parents as they wait to move back into their home after it was damaged by fire. We thank you, Lord, that Murray's son Thomas is getting better after being hurt in a fall, that Bill Walker's mother is doing much better after suffering from a systemic infection even being on hospice for a while, but now is, is doing so much better. And we thank you, Lord, that the biopsy results from Linda McDermott's brother, Jim, showed no cancer. Lord, we thank you for all of the healing and wholeness that you bring to people, for the spiritual wholeness that you bring into our lives as we mm -hmm. listen to your word. We thank you, Lord, for the cooler weather and the season change. All of these, we know we receive as gifts from you and your grace. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that 
Jesus taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is now the part of the service where we ask you what you can give back to God. One of the ways you can give back to God, we believe, is by supporting the ministry of this church. You know, we give out food to the hungry, we do a food bank, we provide excellent musical programs for people, um, and we bring this to you every week, every week. Our church comes into your home. If you would like to support this ministry, we would appreciate that, and we thank you for your gift. You can go to our webpage, and there's a place where you can give through a secure portal. You can mail or drop by a check or cash to the church, however you want to do it. But consider what you are going to give to God this week. Oh, Lord, take these, our gifts, and may they be used to build up your kingdom for your glory, now and forever. Amen. Before we leave, I want to offer you a challenge this week. Look at your life and look at maybe one tradition, just one, that enhances your relationship with God. And make sure that you're following that tradition. And then look for one tradition that you have that isn't really working for you. And be bold and free and let it go. May the love of God fall upon you like a soft summer rain. May the grace of Jesus surround you like the air you breathe. And may the power of the Holy Spirit work in and through you now and forevermore. Amen.